What a wonderful word that if I can help somebody as I pass along, then my living shall not be in vain. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, in the spirit of the same song, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Let they not be in vain, but let them help somebody. Let me help someone as I pass along. We thank you and we praise you for this preaching moment. We pray that you speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Last Sunday, I preached following Jesus, and today is part two of the message, following Jesus, the edgy, radical, fearless Jesus. Today is part two of this two-part sermon. In my introduction last week, I shared about the existence of a Christian chapel, cross and all, in the Cape Coast slave castle on the shores of Ghana. The chapel positioned directly above the slave dungeons. Christians, Christians were indeed capturing people, fishers of men, if you will, shipping them across the ocean, enslaving them for forced labor through which America's wealth was built, treating them brutally, buying and selling, breaking up families, erasing culture, lynching while burning crosses, terrorizing communities, community violence unmatched by any other. That, that may be a little further than I went last week, but the implication was there were so-called followers of Jesus who apparently knew nothing about the Jesus they claimed to follow. So they painted him white, idolized him in image only, and counted on followers not studying the words and deeds of Jesus, but simply falling in line with white supremacy, black and brown inferiority, and the rest is indeed history. A history that many would like to erase more than they want to erase its after effects. Part two of this lesson then is also following Jesus and the lectionary had it set up perfectly because it offered to preachers and readers this week an example of an edgy, radical, te the teachings of a fearless Jesus. Again, there's no way those who oppressed and terrorized others for their own gain knew this Jesus. And it's too late for them, but it's not too late for us. This Sunday scripture begins in a similar manner to last Sunday scripture with the people with the hunger for the words of Jesus. Luke 6 starts with verse 17 reading, Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all of Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And the next verse says, they had come to hear Jesus. The text says they also came to be healed of their diseases, but the part again that I want to emphasize today, as I did last week, is that the people came from all around to hear Jesus. And take note that it says it's a great crowd of his disciples, not just the 12 disciples, actually named one by one earlier in the chapter, but a great crowd of his disciples. In other words, a great crowd who were indeed followers of Jesus, 
for that's what disciple means. This group wanted to be there for good reasons. They were not gathering to test Jesus, not out of simple curiosity. They wanted to know what this man named Jesus had to say. If I'm a disciple in that day, I'm a dedicated follower. And I want to know what he has to say because it is forming me and it is shaping me and it is helping me live into and up to the principles and standards of my leader. And there's something compelling about what he's teaching and doing is countercultural in this society that, do, that just doesn't seem to be for the common good. If I'm in the society of Jesus's day, I see people hurting. I see this great divide between the haves and the have nots. I see violence and chaos and inequalities and inequities. And I want to do something about it. And this man, Jesus, is on the scene saying things I've never heard and doing things like healing the sick, even on the Sabbath, and demonstrating abundance and showing compassion and speaking truth to power like to that fox King Herod. So I am so compelled if I'm in Jesus's day, I'm committed to following him and he's in town and I want to know what he's going to say. I need to hear it. That's who's in the crowd in today's text and hopefully in today's church as preachers all around are preaching from this text, from the lectionary, oh, for a hunger to hear Jesus. It's so critical for followers of Jesus to hear Jesus. It's so critical for followers of any leader to hear that leader. What are that leader's values? What does he or she stand for? How do their values and positions on life affect not only me, but others? How will his or her positions compel me to live and to live with my neighbors? Don't simply be a blind follower of any leader. That causes problems, history tells us, and can lead to your destruction. And I'm persuaded that as a preacher and a pastor, it is my job to ensure that you know the teachings of Jesus. And in the scripture today, where the words in your Bible might be in red, denoting that these are the words of Jesus, I want you to hear Jesus today. Hear him, take it in. He's saying some pretty radical, challenging stuff that would even today make many who follow him uncomfortable. It might even make some who claim to follow Jesus stop claiming it. Oh, that's what Jesus stands for? I'm not following that. That's against everything I believe. Jesus' words and actions were so radical and challenging that they made people not only want to hang him, but, but they carried it out when they crucified him. And Jesus, knowing this is the risk, says what he says anyway. Knowing that although it might bring about his death, that it would eventually give life to all of God's people. So he persists. And he says in verse 20, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. In his first three Beatitudes called this from the sermon called the Sermon on the Plain, the poor Hungry, weeping, describe actual socioeconomic conditions of the people. Jesus says, blessed are you who are poor and you who are hungry and you who weep. Actual socioeconomic conditions of the people in the crowd who were then under Roman rule. Interesting that those so same socioeconomic conditions exist today for many reasons across this world and this country, and in some cases at the hands of so-called followers of Jesus. Poverty, hunger, and conditions that lead to weeping are preventable in the wealthiest country in the world, preventable in the world-class city of Chicago, 
preventable in this community of knowledge, privilege, and wealth, but only if there is a strong will to do something about it. Not only preventable, but addressing it might prevent the problems currently plaguing us like gun violence and homelessness. And while we are upset about gun violence, sometimes we need to ask ourselves, what's the greater violence? Poverty and hunger are indeed violent. And if you, if you ask sociologists right here at the University of Chicago, they will tell you that poverty and hunger lead to violence. Jesus' teachings are indeed relevant for us today, but maybe, just maybe, you're thinking Jesus is speaking spiritually. After all, Jesus is the son of God. He's talking about the spirit, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Didn't I hear that somewhere? Glad you asked. When you hear Luke 6, 20, blessed are the poor, your ears may be waiting for the first beatitude of Matthew 5, blessed are the poor in spirit. Biblical scholar, Dr. R. Allen Culpepper states in his commentary on Luke that Matthew's version of this beatitude, which adds the words poor in spirit is a revisionist interpretation. Hear this, Dr. Culpepper says that the revisionist interpretations began as early as Matthew's gospel to change the poor to poor in spirit and to change hunger to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And I don't usually quote scholars this much, but Dr. Culpepper nails this one when he says, spiritualizing the Beatitudes grants those who are not poor access to the Beatitudes but it also domesticates Jesus's scandalous gospel. Hear Jesus's words today, blessed are the poor, full stop, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Don't spiritualize it. Also be careful not to think that it idealizes nor glorifies poverty but hear that it speaks of God's commitment to those who are living in poverty and that this is contrary to God's will, particularly due to oppression, exploitation, and human injury. This message reverberates throughout the Old and the New Testament, but it's radical because it makes us uncomfortable. It's radical because it's countercultural. It's radical because it's against all of our American values. So we look over it, ignore it, and spiritualize it. Or as Culpepper says, we domesticate Jesus. Let's not participate in domestication of Jesus' scandalous gospel, but let's celebrate that Jesus was indeed addressing the poverty and the hunger of that day, and therefore we should in this day. God's word doesn't always have to be about us and what we can get from God. And I'm glad that I serve a God who cares for those who are poor and has plans to reverse their stations in life. And let me say, as I said last week, that while we're waiting on God, just maybe God is waiting on us to do something about it. So let's hear the words of Jesus today. Repent if we've gotten it wrong and figure out what to do about it together. Pastor Sarah preached a powerful sermon following the death of Mr. Samuel Harvard, the gentleman who was homeless and died in the cold right down our block. And her sermon addressed the Christian church's handling of the poor and the homeless. Pastor Sarah's sermon came to me as I prepared this sermon. See, as a black woman, when I hear blessed are the poor, I think of and identify with black people across this land that are marginalized, oppressed, and poor. I had to come to the realization that I myself am not poor. I'm not wealthy, but I'm far from poor. So I too need to take heed, 
hear God's preference for the poor and determine what does that mean for me? I'm not offended by it, I'm motivated by it, for it could say, blessed are the rich, for theirs is the kingdom. Now and later, too bad, so sad, poor people, but that's not what it said. Jesus' words, blessed are the poor, the hungry, and those who weep are words that ignite a fire within me that the God I serve knows about the struggles of humanity and is preparing an alternative community that reverses the impact of imperialism in Jesus' day and exploitation, enslavement, and oppression in our day. And that you and I, as followers of Jesus, get to participate in the work that Jesus' ministry began. So you're feeling some kind of way when the poor and the brokenhearted are always lifted up as God's favorite? And you're looking for yourself in the word. Where do you fit in when you are not poor nor brokenhearted? Great question. Find yourself on the side of God and align yourself with the mission of God. Participate in the work of God. And there's no better person who sets the example of alignment with the mission of God and doing the work of God than the Jesus that we follow actually follow Jesus, however, and not just any Jesus, but the fearless Jesus speaking this edgy, radical, challenging word. This Jesus who later flips tables, this Jesus who said, blessed are the poor, and that has disturbed you that, okay, disturbance is good, but be disturbed enough to align yourself with the work that aids the poor and the hungry and those who weep. And when you do, the next beatitude may be for you. It reads in verse 22, blessed are you when people hate you. And when they exclude you, revile you and defame you on account of the son of man, rejoice in that day and leap for joy for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. First, we should ask, why would people hate, exclude, revile you, and defame you on account of Jesus? Well, when you start living in ways that make the poor a priority, when you start fighting for laws and advocating for those changes that pay livable wages, when you start fighting gentrification and fighting for truly affordable housing in nice areas, when you start living this gospel and giving preferential treatment to the poor, you'll find out just how unpopular the teachings of Jesus really are. And you too will become unpopular and un unwanted in society, but don't worry about it. For Jesus said, when you start living and advocating in ways that align with the gospel, with the teachings of Jesus and people start to hate you and exclude you, don't fear, but rejoice in that day. Leap for joy, Jesus says, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that, here Jesus, is what the ancestors did to the prophets. Jesus went there again. Jesus brought up the ancestors. Jesus brought up history. He didn't ban the books that say that the ancestors hated and reviled and defamed the prophets. The books are right here for us to read. We call it the Old Testament and the New Testament. This scandalous Jesus, not afraid to tell the truth, says rejoice when you start aligning yourself with the gospel to usher in the kingdom of God where the poor will be rich and the hungry will be filled and the weeping will laugh. Rejoice, Jesus says, when you start aligning yourself and your behaviors and your decisions with God and with the gospel. And when people begin to exclude you, for that is what the ancestors did to the prophets. Dr. King and Medgar Edvers and John F. Kennedy and so many others come to mind. May they rest in peace. The ancestors Jesus was referring to were the Israel's religious leaders who denied God's redemptive work was for all people. 
and condemn the prophets who spoke God's word of justice. Know this for sure that supremacy and privileges, privilege are not of God and the woes in the scripture bear it out. Verse 24, but woe to you who are rich for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now. For you will be hungry. Woe to you, Jesus says. You who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. I encourage you to consider the woe. They point right back to the blessings. They emphasize that God cares for the poor. They emphasize that the rich must be careful for wealth can encumber your reliance on God. Do not put their trust and faith in wealth, but lean on the everlasting arm. And while you're leaning, align yourself to the word of God and the work of God. Woe to you who are full, for you will be hungry as further emphasis to care about those who hunger now. Align yourself with the work of God. Woe to you who laugh. Clearly simple laughter is not the problem. But this implies that those who laugh now do not have a care in the world among all the cares in the world. It's further emphasis to care about those who weep now and again align yourself with the work of God. And the final woe, woe to you when all speak well of you. But that is what the ancestors did to the false prophets. Jesus again reflects on the behaviors of the ancestors and how they loved the false prophets, told them exactly what their ears wanted to hear and made them feel all good inside. Jesus says, whoa, if people are speaking well of you for the implication here is that you aren't doing anything to challenge them or to shake up the status quo. If all speak well of you, it means you're not challenging poverty and homelessness. If all speak well of you, then you've done nothing to challenge their selfishness, privilege, and power. If all speak well of you, then you aren't fighting for livable wages among businesses that keep all the profits for themselves so they can fly to the moon while people right here don't have shelter over their heads. If all speak well of you, then you're not fighting for good schools, health care, and mental health services that address the trauma caused by a history of oppression in black and brown communities. Hear Jesus today. That if all speak well of you, maybe you aren't doing any table flipping or truth telling. And as I close this two-part sermon on following Jesus, all I ask is that if you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to hear Jesus. The edgy, radical, fearless Jesus. Don't run from his words, but seek understanding. Don't spiritualize his words. He's talking about the conditions in which God's children live. Seek understanding and act accordingly. And I assure you, I assure you, that if you act accordingly, you don't have to worry about the woes. You'll actually be among the blessed who are blessing others because you too have been blessed. And you'll be blessed when it matters most. God bless you.